golf, golf in the state originally started in uh, late 1880s, early 1890s, I don't recall which, at Town and Country Club in St. Paul. That was the first golf course in the state. Uh, and then the game grew from, from there bit by bit, not a lot before 1900. Uh, by 1900, there were probably 10 clubs in the state, one of which was uh, Bryn Mawr in the Bryn Mawr neighborhood of Minneapolis, west of downtown. And Bryn Mawr actually spawned, the, the members from Bryn Mawr left and, and they spawned Interlaken and Minicata, two of the esteemed courses in Minnesota. Uh, and then uh, golf continued to grow uh, 1900 through 1910 and then 1910 through 1920. And 1920 is when things really kicked in uh, in so many areas of, of American life. Um, sports got really big with baseball and boxing and golf just took off with people like uh, Bob Jones, Walter Hagen, and, uh, and the 1920s became what's called the golden age of golf design. And you had great architects like Donald Ross, A.W. Tillinghast, Seth Rayner, uh, all of whom worked, did, did courses in Minnesota. Uh, they turned out courses by the dozens. There were some, uh, including White Bear's own Tom Varden and a fellow named Tom Bendelow out of Chicago. Bendelow has been credited with up to 800 courses, maybe more. Uh, Varden did at least, probably close to 50 in the upper Midwest, uh, but golf just exploded in the 1920s. And then, um, as we all know, 1929 came along, the stock market crashed, and by about, uh, the course construction continued through 29, 30, maybe 31, and then by that time the depression had, uh, had really hit, and then, and, and then at that point, uh, there were as many courses being lost as there were being built. I have, uh, I have reasonably good uh, evidence on 87 lost golf courses in Minnesota. I would guess that there were twice as many that I, that I don't know about. And of those 87, um, more than half of them were created in the 1920s and folded in the 1930s or 1940s. It's, a, it's, it's such a common thread and common dynamic. Um, they were built during the good times and then uh, the depression or the other factor that played a big role was uh, the 1941 coming along and, world, and uh, U.S. entrance into World War II and all the men left to go overseas. There was nobody left to play the golf courses. Uh, because the men were doing most of the playing of golf at that time and the women who were left either didn't play golf or the women who were left were focusing also focusing on keeping their homes together or helping with the war effort uh, uh, here so so golf uh, took a hit there uh, but it's a very uh, uh, it's a curious and a very uh, patterned uh, 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 very much a pattern of golf courses starting and disappearing. Who built the courses? Who built the lost golf courses that uh, that I'm writing about? Uh, uh, they were they were they might have been the banker in town who had a little money and uh, and bought a plot of land and and uh, and might have gone out and planted uh, flag sticks in the ground. There were farmers who did it. Uh, then from there it upgraded a little bit. Uh, a number of people who had uh, uh, moderate uh, knowledge of the game or even a fair amount of knowledge of the game but no uh, background in architecture. Some of those people would build the courses. And then from there you would graduate up to some people who maybe had done a little bit of course design. <music> the most prominent of all was a fellow named Tom Varden, the former head professional at White Bear Yacht Club. 
Uh, he, his brother Harry won six British Open titles. Tom Varden was an accomplished golfer. Tom was English. He came over to the States in the 1910s, and he, uh, he, he, was, a, he was a golf pro. He was an excellent teacher, and, and he uh, built about 40 to 50 golf courses, mostly in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and, uh, and around there. And uh, Varden was... Varden might be the single most overlooked and important figure in Minnesota golf, certainly one of the two or three most important. He, he, uh, he had his hands on so many things, and he was so accomplished. Uh, but many people don't know anything about him. I do know about some of Varden's courses. Uh, he, uh, he did Eau Claire. He did uh, nine holes at Stillwater uh, Country Club. He, he designed the Les Bolstead Golf Course at the University of Minnesota. So he has an established uh, track record. I, I think the reason he was so good is just because he, largely because he was from, uh, from England and, and had, had played all the great games of the British Isles, which is uh, where the game started. So you get a, a solid foundation from that. And, he, um, and I'm sure his brother knew a lot of good courses. Uh, but the thing that I don't know a lot about Varden is a lot of the golf courses that he designed, uh, lost courses that he designed. I don't know too much about them because there isn't a lot of record other than word of mouth or people saying it was a, it was an excellent golf course because these courses are gone, uh, almost completely wiped off the map. There is next to no evidence of them. <laughs> One of them in White, uh, White Bear Lake, actually it was White Bear Township at the time, now is Gem Lake, is called Matoska Country Club. And if the people who know where the current Gem Lake Hills golf course is, it is directly uh, west of Gem Lake Hills golf course, only about 250 yards. There's a development now called Hillary Farms, uh, Hillary Farm Development and uh, in Gem Lake. That was almost all the former Matoska Country Club, which was a nine-hole course designed by Varden. Um, I, I had written some, uh, a decent amount, amount about it, but I didn't know too much about it. Late in my writing process, I happened across uh, a fellow from Vadness Heights who caddied the course. I uh, got lucky there, so we went and spent uh, a couple of hours, and he told me what he knew about the course. <music> Most of them predictably uh, disappeared from the, from the Twin Cities area, uh, from Lakeville to Bayport to Gem Lake to Columbia Heights, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chanhassen, uh, uh, later Brooklyn Park, Coon Rapids, there was a golf course right, right along the Mississippi River. So about maybe 30 to 40 percent of the courses were, were Twin Cities courses, predictably because of the population. Uh, but the other really interesting thing is there was a, a swath of lost golf courses all along the southern probably 30 to 40 miles of the state from, from east to west. Uh, from Caledonia uh, in the southeastern corner. There were actually three lost golf courses in Caledonia, a little town of 2,500 people. Uh, and all the way across to Pipestone in the southwestern corner, there were three lost golf courses in Pipestone too. But all across what used to be uh, a highway, where is the current I-90 I corridor, um, and I think that was traveled by a fair amount of people in that time. But n almost all the small towns had golf courses, and many of those are lost golf courses. Uh, to a lesser extent, well, there are three lost courses in Duluth, Chisholm, there's one, Bemidji, Roseau, uh, all around other parts of the state, but primarily the Twin Cities and that whole southern corridor. <laughs> I like to think that you and I played them. I mean, I guess I'm kind of an old blue-collar golfer from 
from way back and and uh and it was anybody it was the it was the farmer after their day of work it it tended to be as a few people told me it tended to be bankers and business people and people in town who had spent all day in their office and then wanted to go out and play a round of golf in the evening typically nine hole courses uh, many of them with sand greens at least half of them with sand greens rather than grass greens the lost courses uh, but it was it was very common people generally there were a few really good players who who played at some of these courses patty berg pa played at a course called westwood hills in st louis park uh, which was probably the best of all of the lost courses in minnesota a 27 hole course with a lot of history <laughs> The thing that struck me the most was was being able to track down some of the people who who played these courses and uh, they, they tended tended to more be people who caddied them um, and they were maybe 10 or 15 years old uh, in the 30s when they when they closed down and they basically said they were they were pretty simple courses as I said with sand greens um, and uh, uh, there was a course in in west central Minnesota that had eight holes. Uh, the farmer didn't have enough land to build nine holes, so they built eight and went out and played one hole again to make it a nine hole course. Um, uh, there were municipal courses that were uh, built uh, built and financed by the cities. Uh, they met with mixed success, just as the the privately financed courses did. There were very few country clubs that became lost courses. Uh, Bryn Mawr was a country club. There's a course called Northwood in North St. Paul. That, that was Minnesota's first Jewish golf club. Uh, that was a country club. Um, uh, but generally they, they, they tended to come in many shapes, many sizes. Uh, many owners, many different kinds of players. There were some great stories related mostly through old newspapers. Uh, there was a course in Winona called Meadowbrook, uh, started in 1898, so it's one of the oldest courses in Minnesota. And, uh, and the Winona newspaper at the time uh, printed a long description of the game uh, with some very curious uh, references that we now would kind of chuckle at and I chuckled at when I read them and there was there was a course in Grand Rapids that was a, v a very small course built by a multi multi millionaire uh, family in the 19 late 1910s the golf course lasted until 1970 it was it was a private estate private resort they built a golf course along 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 uh, within the estate and I went up and visited that golf course. The most unusual course was uh, was a course built next to the Stillwater Prison in Bayport, built for the inmates very briefly in the 1970s. I think I, I raised the eyebrows of a person who works for the corrections department by suggesting that there was a, a golf course on that site, but I have it confirmed from two people who worked on the golf course that there was very briefly a golf course there. It was intended to, to use to get the, uh, uh, the inmates acclimated uh, back into society. <laughs> the course in Bayport went away because Highway 95 came along, basically, although the, the course was not doing real well at the time. Uh, uh, Westwood Hills in St. Louis Park um, went away for a variety of, variety of reasons, one of which was there was uh, consistent pressure to develop that area. Well, in fact, one of the earliest lost golf courses was Bryn Mawr in Minneapolis, and, uh, and that, by 1910, that course had disappeared, mostly because of development. There were two courses in, in uh, St. Paul in the... Uh, um, in 
in the Merriam Park neighborhood, one called Merriam Park, another called Roadside. Those were squeezed out by development. So yeah, development uh, did get a number of courses. <laughs> I don't know the inner workings of the WPA and how it worked with cities, but my guess is that a number of towns had seen their golf courses either fade or disappear, or in the case of a place like Ortonville in western Minnesota, they had a course that was uh, maybe five miles out of town and was not probably not particularly uh, ostentatious or anything. So... Uh, probably the folks in Ortonville, either the golf club or maybe, or maybe some of the city, city leaders or maybe a combination of both said, we've got a great piece of land and if we can get the WPA labor involved, it's a nice cheap way for us to build a better golf course than what we have. And in the case of a place like Ortonville, it turned into a, a huge success because they built 18 holes, uh, eventually, uh, uh, the f part of it with WPA labor and that uh, that course to my knowledge is going very strong today <music> lots of uh, lots of telephone calls I have some because I've been writing about golf for a long time I did ha I do have some contacts uh, a number of people uh, who know the game so I was able to contact and a lot of times you talk to somebody who would talk to somebody who would talk to somebody and then you'd find out about lost golf courses so a golf golf course so I found out that way um, I made lots of phone calls many many phone calls um, I spent a fair amount of time in libraries uh, and uh, doing uh, searches of golf old golf magazines and archive materials <laughs> I'm not positive, but I think I set, I think last year I set the world record for most Google searches in one year. Well, I just, just a lot of Google searches. And, uh, and that, that helped me find a lot of information. Yeah. I would do any kind of, any combination of words that I could possibly think of. And then when somebody might tell you that there was a, that there was a lost uh, golf course, that there was a course in Chanhassen, for instance, and you knew a little bit about the golf course, you just keep doing searches and uh, maybe on the 20th search you might find out something like the golf course was built next to a sanitarium which has a rich history or a golf course was built in Lakeville next to a large amusement park. Uh, but just l lots of lots of working that it's just kind of old-fashioned detective work really. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the in the Minnesota History Center. Uh, generally, um, I probably didn't spend as much time in libraries as one might think I did because I really what I really wanted to do more than anything was not just get uh, recitations of of newspaper accounts and things like that, which obviously were really helpful, but I wanted to find people who knew about the courses or maybe maybe live on the property now and thankfully and maybe 40% of the courses I was able to find somebody who who knew the course or knew the land or something like that and they told stories that to me give the book a, a personal edge that a lot of great golf history books maybe don't have <laughs> Made it to 27 lost golf course sites. Um, some of them you can't see anything. There are a couple of places that there is still one green site at Westwood Hills, which closed in 1962. In there's a nature center there now, and if you go back into the right place in the woods, you can see the green site. There is still a green site from Matoska in Gem Lake, which closed in 1940, although that now is getting grown over. Uh, but beyond that, it's very difficult to find any, anything on any courses that closed uh, uh, 
before about 1970. Almost everything is gone. There is a course in Hugo also, uh, was a course that never started. They had everything, they had almost everything built, uh, but they couldn't quite put, get the financing all put together. So the course was probably 80% built uh, in, I believe it was 1970 and maybe 1960. And, uh, and it never, it wound up never, never getting built and open. Great, a beautiful piece of land. Great stories about, about uh, what happened here one day or, or how you could hit a ball at Rich Acres and hook it onto, onto uh, Cedar Avenue if you weren't careful and uh, uh, just all of, all of the crazy things that happened in the game of golf. Uh, but in general, most, most of the courses I wrote about are from the, f uh, closed in the 30s and 40s, and those were of great interest to me just because there's so much history and because they're courses that most people have never heard of, and I certainly had never heard of until I started this. <laughs> The book, uh, the book will be called Four Gone, that's two words, F-O-R-E, um, exclamation mark, G-O-N-E, Minnesota's Lost Golf Courses, 1897 to 1999. I have finished writing the book, I finished assembling it. Uh, one of the great features of the book, in my opinion, is uh, I was able to get a fellow named Peter Wong to work with me. Peter is the premier uh, golf course photographer in Minnesota, does tremendous work, has done many great photos of Minnesota's best golf courses. And uh, Peter and I went out and we met some of the people who remembered these courses, took photos. Uh, we went down to uh, Whitewater State Park uh, in St. Charles in southeastern Minnesota, uh, the site of a, a beautiful site of a golf course. Peter took some stunning photos from there. And, and the people who I talked to uh, were so cooperative, uh, old golfers and people, families who knew old golfers and historical societies forwarded me lots of photos. So I have great old photos of, uh, of people out on sand greens and, uh, and people with trophies from, from the lost courses. And uh, uh, so I, I got a lot of help there. So it's not going to be just me blathering on about the courses. There will be uh, there will be a fair amount of I got old scorecards, a number of them. So I got a lot of uh, material that I think will really enhance. I hope what I've written. Our research on how they built the courses. Uh, in the early days, it was typical just to build horses with. Uh, uh, did I say horses? If I said horses. They built courses with horses, uh, but it was it was typical just to have a horse uh, pulling a plow, and and the courses were were built that way. Uh, it was called minimalist design uh, because they didn't and couldn't move a lot of earth. Um, obviously, no bulldozers and big earth movers or anything like that. So the architects had to go out and and get the lay of the land, and. Uh, and do careful planning and then move. Generally, you would move enough to build tees and greens and maybe build, build some bunkers and uh, the rest of the course would be natural terrain. Yeah, it was, it was wooden shafts uh, through the 20s and, and a lot of times, uh, uh, a fellow told me about the course in Bayport, uh, right along the St. Croix River uh, which was almost in downtown Bayport, not quite, uh, that typically they, if they went out and played, they might have three clubs in their hand that they were lucky enough to have gotten uh, a wooden 
mashy and a niblick, which are irons, and then maybe a driver and a spoon or a brassy or a, or a wood shafted putter. But generally they'd take uh, three or four golf clubs out and knock the ball around and, uh, and play around the golf that way. Sometimes they didn't have a bag. They did, they did mount, uh, mounds of sand and I saw one or two photos, which I didn't realize until about the past month. They built little, uh, uh, little almost cupboards. Uh, you'd open the lid and you'd uh, take out your, your mound of sand and you'd build a little mound of sand on the ground and that's what you would use to tee your ball up, yes.